Welcome to my distinguished uh, fellow panelists. I would like to broad pace on this definition a little more. Uh, probably an introduction talked about, focused on recruitment alone. While the word did appear in the title, it said organization and recruitment for scale or hiring for scale. I would definitely like to touch upon organization also quite a bit in this discussion because as you scale and as you become bigger, the way your organization is structured and undergoes changes, the processes that you need to adopt, organizational processes that you need to adopt as distinct from programs, operations and so on, all of that assume great significance because mere hiring is not going to be enough. While it's very, very important when you're scaling that you need to hire well, maintaining an organizational integrity or, or changing the organization, the way it functions, inducing and inculcating processes that make the organization sustainable, all of these become very important. For instance, in Agastya, if somebody were to ask me a question on how do you sustain yourself? You're a non-profit, you're a charity, etc. I wouldn't start with funding. I wouldn't say, uh, how will I get my money for next year, year after, and so on as the first thing. The first thing I would start with, can I maintain my vision and mission, and can I get the people? If I have these two, funding follows. That has been our experience. So funding is not at the forefront of our sustainability people are. It may be cliche written to say people are our most important asset, everybody keeps repeating it at most here. But the fact of life is that cliche is important. And maintaining an organizational integrity or a changing organizational design, structure, the way you do your organization processes is equally important. For instance, in Agastya, in the 15 years of our actual big operation and scaling operation, we have gone from small functional organization to what we would call in business as, you know, uh, lines of business, the equivalent of lines of business or lines of activity, to today a truly matrix organization which has got, uh, like any other very large company, uh, a field level work, an office level work which is program management, there are functional specialists and all of them are interacting in a matrix manner. There are multiple reporting relationships and so on. So the organization design itself has undergone substantial change as we have scaled. Similarly in recruitment. Maybe early times you would have done, hey Ram, get Krishna on board. Or he would have said MGM kind of model. Member gets member and those kind of old models. Today it just doesn't sustain. You really have to go into either advertising or college recruitment or getting large number of people into cohorts and whether you have the vacancy or not get a substantial number. And in our case it becomes even more complex because we deal with vernacular teachers in 19 states that we operate. And therefore it's not possible always to have uh, somebody recruited in uh, Andhra Pradesh to go to Jharkhand or uh, somebody in JNK coming and teaching in Tamil Nadu. It just doesn't work. But we still have to have scale and therefore we got to have sufficient number of uh, you know, cohort kind of recruitments, onboarding, training and development, performance level, and the kind of processes that we have added over the period uh, of, of the scale. So all of this becomes very, very important when you do, when you think about organization and hiring for substantial scale. Uh, Agastya's experience has stood us in very good stead even though um, one of the big constraints that a lot of the non-profits face, which might not be the case with uh, Shreddy, but uh, is, is the fact that at least at the foot soldier level, you are not able to match remuneration and compensation levels. And therefore, you want to make sure that you get good people, yet you, you have to have a compensation structure that works and doesn't have too much attention. So one of the things that we do, for instance, just to say uh, what we do for that is, I consider everybody who leaves Agastya as an ambassador of goodwill, as an ambassador who spreads Agastya's message, 
will hopefully go and spread our message, will hopefully teach that way, will hopefully transform a lot of other teachers and children. So that's the only way I can reconcile with addition given, given my conversation policies. So all of these become uh, nuances that people aspiring to scale in this room and elsewhere uh, will have to look at in a, in a, in a non-profit uh, or social enterprise trying to scale, trying to replicate from an organization hiring point of view. I'll stop here and request Mr. Reddy to talk about his experience and his nuances. I think all of you, all of us sitting in this room, you know the basics of how to uh, get the right kind of people, how to retain them, otherwise we have been social influence or working in the government. So probably the challenges are very contextual, very important to understand the context in which that particular organization is being built. The context gets derived from the purpose for which you are doing it. So, Basically, therefore, we need to understand the existential question as to why we are here. We set up a social enterprise, all of you have several 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 options, I suppose, and all of them, all those look some of them may be very lucrative than what you have now. We left all those options and set up the social enterprises or working the social enterprise. First of all, I think there is a purpose, a larger purpose in life as to why one is wanting to do this. And we need to be clear of that and we need to spread that message down below so that so that uh, that message, that sense of purpose is shared by everyone right from the founders to co-founders to the down below. Then next comes what is the specific context? Everybody wants to make a difference. I may have taken the route of skill development and Ms. Dagarajan has taken a route of uh, educating the children to science and she has taken the route of feeding the children with nutritious meal. Ultimately, we are all wanting to make a difference. But within that, the context becomes very important. Example of, uh, since some of these like Mega and few others I can see, who are into skill development here, probably the examples that I narrate will be useful to them. When 2005 and 6, when we started the skill development program, job linked, uh, job linked training program under which you guarantee certain percentage of people, 70% would get placed, then only government pays you. When this model was uh, conceptualized, and obviously we were focusing on downtrodden people below poverty line, like sewing machine operators, welders, electricians, plumbers, a lot of these tradesmen, and they need to be placed in the jobs. And they were all largely school dropouts, college dropouts, and they need to be trained and put in the jobs. And the fact that they could not offer to be long-term programs is one reason why they are out of that system. So they cannot offer to be long-term of one-year, two-year programs, they can't do it. They don't have any ability or affordability to do that. And we need to try them and put them in jobs. So the training duration has to be very, very short. A very short, so they're very appropriate. But it should not be so short that they don't acquire requisite competence, competencies to get employed in the companies. Therefore, they need to be imparted skills because of which on the day one when they are placed on the shop floor, they become employed. Means what is to be taught to them has to be appropriate to the industry. So who will teach them? The trainers. Where do you get the trainers? You heard of, the, you, we keep hearing the horror stories about the just fresh graduates of polytechnics and engineering becoming IDA teachers who have never worked in industry. And our students don't have luxury of being part of the system for two years, like IDA system does. So it has to be very short term, 90 days and 600 days, sorry, uh, 100 days kind of programs that we run. So what we did, first thing was, trainers we hired from the industry. We never went by qualification. We never went where the graduates or post graduates. Because what we required, we are supposed to import certain level of competencies to the students. If uh, the uh, industrial sewing machine operator is supposed to stitch X number of shirts in an hour on that machine, that's how the productivity is measured. So therefore, we hired the trainers from the industry shop floor, and who is at least 12th pass, all right, who has been working in industry in a shop floor supervisor capacity, then who understands how the productivity measures, and we recruited them. But they do not have the trainer skills because as being a teacher, supervisor is different from being a teacher. So being a teacher, then you need to have the entire pedagogy and kind of classroom management for two, three, four, put them through.
through a one month of training of trainers program. We designed what we call Mastery, a training of trainers program. So that's how the first batch of trainers we heard. 12th pass, working in industry for minimum 5 years, who has aptitude, passion for training, who sees that sense of purpose being aligned to doing something good, and then we imparted skills to them. Now today we have employed 3,000 such trainers. 3,000 such trainers in the country, and many of them are taught to graduate students. Therefore, my first point is that when we are talking about building the organization, when we understand the context, and the most critical pain point in the context being the trainers. Without trainers, the whole model of short-term job link program would collapse. Therefore, we need to get the right skill sets and then put the systems and process in place. Then how do we incentivize? And uh, slight difference is that uh, we are a social enterprise, but our uh, remuneration would be like yours, except that we are for profit. But how do you retain them? So the incentive structure aligned to your outcomes. What are the outcomes that I expect? The number of students who pass out of a college will have to pass out of an institute. We run 200 such institutes. Each one would be like mini, uh, uh, there will be workshops or welding workshop, electrical workshop, one, two, three, four. When they pass out, minimum 75% have to be placed. All right? Once with minimum wages, PF, ESI and all that. Once they get placed, they need to continue in jobs for a minimum period of three to six months. So higher the retention, higher the placement, higher the retention, higher the assessment, we will do the third part assessment, and that those trainers who are responsible for higher outcomes will get incentivized. So incentives being aligned to the outcomes. Then there is a motivation level. Otherwise, how do you differentiate between a good trainer and a bad trainer? Everybody gets the same. So we need to be therefore, that's one of the reasons as to how we should aim to retain, otherwise we run in Jammu Kashmir, in Srinagar, part of Srinagar city, where other than army or BSF, CFP of nobody goes, and we run training centers. How do you actually keep the people? Very, very important to align the incentive structure. The third point on again building the organization, we talk about we are a skill development company, context is very important. But unless we continue to upskill our own people, they are not expect, how do we expect them to go around and impart the skills? So we created a program called Link U, we call it. And it's a continuous upskilling. Every trainer of our skill undergo that every year once. There's an induction program of mastery. After that they grade, get graded A, B, C. They come to the organization. Thereafter, they are there. At, at the end of every year, they need to undergo an assessment as to what they proficiency levels as a trainer. So there is again category A, B, C, C guys are told to reappear and again every year it gets. So if continuous to for three years, if they don't perform well and they are asked uh, properly, you do not have sufficient skills to be trainer, we can look for some other job. But this, by, without a very uh, dynamic L&D program, learning and development program, you can't expect them to acquire skills. Therefore, we created sort of blended uh, program for uh, learning and development. Again, I'll come back with some example. Say, hospitality trainer, the trainer who is actually training the youth to uh, serve as a waiter in a uh, restaurant. But then, that trainer needs to be upskilled to do some more stuff, isn't it? There is a front office management, there are new hotels coming up, there's an entirely complete different uh, way of customer engagement. So, who put them through the modules? We develop um, a very robust learning and development program, very sector specific, along with other skills that are required to be trained in communication 1, 2, 3, 4, and they necessarily have to go through this learning and development program. And thereafter, we assess them. Therefore, I think continuous learning and development assessment, that program is also very, very important. Uh, if I have to retain the critical uh, competencies in the organization which help in building a sustainable organization. Thank you. And our request. To talk about the brand experience of Akshay Patra and Sri. A very good afternoon to each one of you here in the room. Um, it's my pleasure that I uh, share the stage with Mr. Tyagrajan and Mr. Reddy. And uh, thanks to Desh Pandey Foundation for creating this forum where all the great minds connect in this forum. Okay. Um, uh, just a quick update about uh, Akshay Patra. Uh, in the year 2000, uh, Akshay Patra was serving about 1,500 uh, 1, children with so just uh, five government schools, right? And now, 
um, I think Mr. Murthy was mentioning, uh, in the year 2017, we reached 1.9 million. So it's about 17 lakhs children. So it's a very vast scale, if you see, for the past uh, 17 years. And we are in the year 19, so now we plan to actually do the 3 billion meals, hopefully. Um, couple of things uh, in the organization, what we need to keep in mind, right? Uh, supposing I ask, may I ask a question in this room? Asking, anybody can answer. Uh, Who is the most intelligent person in this room? Sorry? Maybe everybody? Any other answer? Sorry? What is your Who is the most intelligent person in this room? All the students. Myself. Yourself? Fantastic. Any other question? Any other answer? All the students are perfect. Whoever knows he is not that perfect. Yeah. All the students are the class. All the students of the class. All the participants. Who is asking the question? <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. Students to know more and learn more all the time. Okay. Um, well, this is what actually we did in Akshay Patra when I asked, who is the most intelligent person? It's us. Right? It's we. So, this is what we did in Akshay Patra, taking the employees along with us. So, if you see the impact what Akshay Patra has done is because of the employees. We have taken the employees along with us which is a very important factor where we need to understand employees are our main and core assets. Right? Yes or no? Yes. yes. Alright. There are a couple of things which uh, we have done during the scale up of employees. Now that we are in 42 kitchens in 12 states. So the challenge is how do you set your process across in a very consistent way, right? You can keep expanding, but then how do you keep all your processes, your people, your culture, you know, in a very consistent way? That becomes a challenge. So there have been a couple of things where we have set the process so that uh, Akshay Patra as an organization uh, works very well in a very uh, federated spirit because in 12 states, 40 kitchens, we have different operations. Right? So, that is one bit of it. And we recently uh, launched the, uh, what do you call the Akshay Patra Academy. So, that actually uh, takes care of uh, its employees for training in terms of fundraising, leadership <laughs> training, and for operations. So, that whatever processes or trainings we do, this is only for employees within Akshay Patra, we are consistent. So, uh, we also set a couple of processes like uh, 40 hours of training for the employees as mandatory for their performance review. So, with this, it becomes a learning organization and a learning culture, which is very important. As Mr. Reddy was mentioning, it's only the learning and training actually when we are scaling up, which plays a very important role. Even in Akshay Patra, we follow the same thing. We did a couple of things like competency framework. That's the basic necessity at the time of hiring, when you're hiring in BAS. So you want to understand what is the competency level of your candidates when you're hiring. So when we have the competency framework in place, during the recruitment cycle itself, we assess what is the competency level. And then we carve out their training. So it becomes easier for us because Training at times what happens during, uh, we usually do it during the performance review. So a lot of training comes out only if you have assessed the candidate. But for us, we do it right from the stage of the recruitment. So it's in the same level as uh, beginner capable proficient and expert in the same categories. That's how we do that. So it becomes easier and then you actually enable the employee to enhance his skills. So this is how we have been doing. And a um, lot of uh, uh, leaders are homegrown because 
when you are growing in a vast scale, we expect um, to promote our internal growth because it becomes important so that employees also feel it's very important that they have been, they have been given an opportunity and growth within the organization. So we have a couple of homegrown leaders and then um, we have a couple of initiatives like succession planning in place. So where we have identified at least about 50 leaders across the organization and then we develop all our leaders. So whenever there is an opportunity and uh, the mobility plays an important role, whoever wants to get transferred can go and help the operations. We are most welcome to do that. So in this way, anytime there is a kitchen which opens, so we have our in-house leaders to go and lead the main operation rather than hiring somebody from outside. And uh, one thing I must say that Akshay Patra has full of innovations. We have registered for about 5,000 odd licenses. So, which is a huge number. So, people are very innovative and the innovation culture is very well recognized and opportunities are given. And one thing what we did in the last three years is we went in for Great Place to Work certification which actually helps the organization in terms of your process, your benefits. It also helps every employee to feel nice that they are working for a great place in the organization. So this is about it. Uh, on the homegrown leaders, which Robert talked about, is very, very important. I think uh, the live example is here, such a fantastic conference of development dialogue. And look at the profiles of uh, the delegates who come in from several countries here. And all being handled by homegrown leaders like Jagdish sitting there to all his colleagues who are around here. They are all recruited here to probably first set of employees. They have been here today, they are able to pull it off in an international conference. And very, very important that element, I, I think many of the one common speak of many sustainable successful organizations are the opportunities that are provided for talent identification, career planning and uh, promotions and higher responsibility being given to the locals. I'll quote our own example and because currently the person who heads our national entire country operations in looks after of all government sports and skill development programs. And uh, Abhishek, he joined as a, as a trainer in one of the institutes. And he became master trainer, he became territory manager, he became a national level programmer, a pro national level leader. He is responsible for 100,000 students, youth being trained and placed in this year. And that's the capability of that individual. I think that's very, very important of homegrown talent. I think always, obviously, that needs to be there in terms of reminding them this is not to be taken for granted and giving an opportunity for them for cross cultural exposure and sending them outside the organization for periodical trainings and exposure, management development programs, that can be pillar. In social enterprise, it's very important of identification of homegrown enterprise, uh, homegrown leaders and uh, see that they actually assume larger responsibility in their lives. So the next round of observations from my fellow panelists and our own experience, let me go a little deeper into recruitment or hiring for scale. What are the nuances? What are the challenges? For instance, what are the challenges that I can right away think about from the very well-placed remarks on homegrown leaders or promoting within or finding leaders from within? When you're scaling, it's not always possible for you to do so. What are the challenges? How are you going to get an external person into a role without hard burn, matching salaries, all kinds of issues arise when you start putting in external people in. And it's a particularly stark issue if you have an organization like ours where there is what one level instructors who are, you know, science graduates who have joined you fresh and you have done some level of teaching in remote locations using mobile labs or science centers. And then suddenly you call upon them to perform managerial duties. <coughs> Simple stuff like accounting, like planning for scheduling, liaisoning with the school, 
getting some uh, you know some guidance and work done from district education authorities these skills have not come they are not they are not management graduates or they are not they are not gone through uh, that kind of training so suddenly you will find some of them are shocked when you start start looking for area leaders regional leaders and so on so you do have to at times recruit laterally how do you manage that challenge is something that i would like to pose to the crew of them as we go along but in the meantime let me just add a couple of nuances in the way agastya hires for scale one of the things that we do and he said that when he talked about initially hiring the trainers you would expect that our skill profile would be you must hire mscs for doing stem related work in schools we do but for us the more important degree is bee what is bee it's not bachelor of electrical engineer it's bachelor of energy and excitement because that's what we want our teacher primarily to bring to the classroom not necessarily boyle's law or uh, you know something else in physics that uh, at once need to be imparted to the child because science is but an aim to is but a medium to an end which is curiosity creativity confidence to try and i spoke and therefore we look for a teacher who can excite the class get the child class to interact therefore the contextualization that uh, dr reddy talked about is very very important when you recruit so uh, if you go with very rigid things say oh he's going to teach science and therefore let us hire out the mscs and phds it doesn't work somebody who is very exciting is far more important than somebody who hasn't done that well in science because science is important but excitement is not so easily important so look for the right qualities when you are uh, recruiting the second thing that i would say and again related to my first remark is in a social enterprise or in a non profit or in a charity when you are not able to compensate the absolute market levels or corporate market levels you really have to look for people with passion or get the right equation between in the, in the continuum of visionary versus mercenary somebody who believes in the program and will give anything for it and somebody who working purely for money because of functional skills that he can deliver to the organization the missionary versus the mercenary equation we tend to be a little more mercenary at the foot soldier level and as you move up as you become program manager regional manager general manager and those kind of levels we definitely look for higher and higher proportion of mercenaries and that's also a great guideline for promoting from within coming back to the workers so these two three nuances from how we hire is something that i want to leave with you when you stay now i would like to you know listen to your challenges of lateral recruitment and some of the things that i talk about we like to go first it's okay um it's so very true the missionary spirit in akshay park the dna of akshay park is we have missionaries and professionals working so this dna has worked very well and it is one of its unique kind for us so when you talk about the missionary spirit so they are very great in terms of service so it's a very mixed um, and blended dna in nakshapatra what we have you will find missionaries and professionals working together so this is the success story of akshapatra coming to hiring um, we don't just hire only from food background we have from various backgrounds lateral hire happens all across anybody who is passionate who is able to perform are given the opportunity so this is one key learning for us in recruitment not to just get um, saying that only a degree holder or you know just a professional only they are allowed to work but you have to ensure that you give them an opportunity it really helps especially in an ngo kind of a field because it typically in the it you know how the it functions 
But if you want somebody to work in an NGO, you need to have that lateral hiring, you need to have someone with a passion and Mr. Reddy already mentioned about the purpose. The purpose is very important and these are the kind of people actually in the long run who will sustain and scale up in the NGO firm. The, this is a very tricky question and it's a very challenge, very, very, very challenge. I think the least any of the homegrown potential leader would expect is that one fine morning a mail goes from the managing director saying that this territory manager has been recruited from outside. So all the while he must have been thinking that slot, that vacant post is going to be more. And there are ways, of, ways to address that. And firstly, I think uh, any organization that we are doing, uh, particularly, again, I give my example, uh, skill development involves several job roles. We have the community mobilizer, we have the trainer, and we have the industry guys. We have the back-end entire content development team, that sits around. And we have the program managers who and the business development team. I think it's very important in organization like uh, Ours, which is engaged in skill development, which has, which virtually has to handle several stakeholders, right? very important stakeholders. We need to create career tracks. Career tracks we need to create in organization like this. So the career track, for example, a trainer is that assistant trainer, trainer, master trainer, and uh, technical, vertical head, we call them technical program manager, and like this. So at least that individual, when she or he joins, can see that there are four levels to which they can grow. All right. Now, 10 to 20 percent of all these tracks at some level are the ones who are fungible. They can switch over. The program manager is the one which is fungible, for general managers. Like people like me who only speak and talk, and, uh, but I can't go and actually teach them on how to stage, isn't it? So, the general management roles are the ones for general management. The many of the, all these four or five tracks, some of the best can come in. Any general manager role, as Ms. Gagarajan talked about, the, it, it's a different ballgame. In other words, it's a p in an enterprise like this. You have to be profit and plus p and later. And for that, not everyone would have. So the moment it is recognized for this manager role, this is the kind of thing. And X gets promoted here out of all these four tracks. And uh, if, these are, if these are clearly articulated, so one is that career tracks to be created, to be articulated, and to be communicated, continuously need to be talking to the people, all right? And if there is an out or uh, a, a kind of lateral hire that's happening in a particular position, and if the system is taken into confidence, that there is going to be lateral hire of this, 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 because none of these career tracks have been able to fill this. So the system accepts. I think there is, and also the individuals, you know, if I'm, we are promoting somebody as X as the director manager, four others are in, uh, are waiting, I think it's the responsibility of the senior management to reach out to those four, sit down with them and then tell them this is what it is. And since there is already a well established track of career learning and development assessment system, then the possibility of reducing friction would be much, much higher. And you can't say that everything would be very good and they can leave also, but the probability of that transition being smooth and change being uh, smooth would be much higher if you actually have these three, four things that I talked about. And uh, having said about uh, the importance of homegrown leaders, I am not uh, uh, saying that the lateral heights or the people coming from outside is not a good thing. Actually, many people come from outside will bring fresh ideas, fresh inputs. It's optimum balance, optimum balance. But there are also lateral heights who come and leave three years, four years, take, take the gym, go to the next, go to the next. And whereas someone who slopped with you when you are nobody in the system and who risked all their lives, all their careers to work with you, I think they deserve to be given the first chance. The first right of refusal of building their competency should lie within the system. If that doesn't happen, then the lateral heights can happen. And provided that the people in the system know there is a lateral hire that happens, it's a part of the organization design, and that will happen only provided none of us have those kind of skills. And then stand the trust the management. It's a, it's a mix of both should happen. <laughs> As a final set of remarks from the panelists here, I want to tie up 
the topic that we have been given to reimagining impact. So as you scale, hiring, organization design, organization processes, which will make the impact much higher. How can the organization and the hiring practices and the processes can contribute to greater impact or a leveraged impact is the question that I would like to pose to my fellow panelists after saying that at Agastya we are acutely conscious of this, that we must have an organization which is geared to enhance impact, which means in one way, it's intermediation. It doesn't always require an Agastya teacher or trainer to transform the learning abilities of hundreds and hundreds of children. We recognize that and we have set three major programs under our umbrella. Beyond a point should not require an Agastya employee. And those are teacher training to make sure that the School teachers, the science teachers in government schools and elsewhere are trained, motivated and committed to do what we do in terms of hands-on learning, project-based learning, experiential learning and so on, which is what makes the child go ah, 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 ah. Can we impart that to the teacher so that I am leveraged out? It's like taking a loan in the bank and taking the loan. And therefore, somebody else works for your goals. So that kind of a thing we do with three major programs one is operational service, the ninth community schools, the other one is young institute leader program, the third one is teacher training, all of which are geared to reimagining impact, yet you're hiring, make sure that the leverage reaches much more number of people than before. So one Agastya leader can become that much more <coughs> effective. So that is something that we are looking at in our Moving out of the organizational envelope and becoming a movement is what we are here to do at this point. The second point I want to make in conclusion before my fellow panelists give their final remarks and before we throw it open to questions is that what she mentioned about hiring from diverse backgrounds. Absolutely. I think heterogeneity and diversity is one of the most important things. It can spur ideas, it can spur innovation. It can, give, it can make up people who are sleeping, as he said, you know, people take things for granted. You have other people coming in and talking about new ideas that really spurs up the organization. But heterogeneity and diversity should not be mistaken at an organizational level to the alignment and homogeneity that you require to run the organization. So the, the, the real success will be when you have diverse people, different backgrounds, different expectations, different age groups, different skill sets, qualifications, experience and all of that. But organizational goals, policies, processes, framework, and objectives, vision, mission are singularly aligned through communication and all of that. So that is really the success of organization and hiring for scale. With a few remarks from my fellow panelists, I would like to throw it open to the uh, audience. See, the reimagining the impact and impact at scale, these are the kind of buzzwords and this of this conference. Um, if you have to look at that in the context of hiring people and organization context, uh, one thing is very obvious. I think the impact uh, can be scale only by way of embedding the ownership of the initiative with the stakeholders. Okay? Suppose if we are doing 200,000 people this year, China, there are about 3,000 staff that work. And apart from that, there will be freelance and one, two, three, four projects. If I have to reach million people, and me hiring about another 7,000 people is not a sustainable uh, solution. What do I do with these 10,000 people if something happens to the ecosystem? Also, where is the ownership? So it's always good that I entirely endorse Mr. Agraj and what you said. I think one other cell leader should be actually create 10 more owners of the process. And we need to work, I think, when all of us work in these organizations in a context of a specific program, in a small geography, when we become redundant. And 
that program is owned and scaled up, then I think that uh, the, that's the symbol of success of the government. Therefore, we need people in hiring and ownership and going, uh, and going forward, the people who believe and think that, that they are ready. Okay? They need to transfer this ownership, transfer this initiative, leadership to the community, to the stakeholders. Those who are excessively possessive, those who think that they know everything, and without me, this village, this community can't do anything, they are just dependent on me. Uh, I think that kind of mindset is not good for the impact in this case. So from the day one, we need to prepare ourselves to be redundant in a context of a particular organization. The moment that mindset is there, and we believe others are equally capable of taking this forward, then this impact is scale can Absolutely. People who can spawn other leaders. I would like to just add on, uh, when you do the lateral hiring, when you have a very diversified crowd, you have it from corporates, you have it from NGOs, you have it from the government sectors. All these are great minds. When they all come together, you know, the impact is huge. And the kind of knowledge sharing which happens, the kind of mentoring which happens, the cross-collaboration, what we call, is just wonderful. And whenever any help is required, we are always backing on each other. So, this is what actually I call a total impact. So, it's very important in an organization that you have a different mix, be it different uh, age groups. It's always, you know, the experiential versus the young minds, what we call it. The learning happens vice versa too. So, when you see an organization like that with total, uh, with the experienced mind, with the young crowd, you know, the diversified background, the lateral hiring, which is happening, you find a greater impact for the society. Uh, there are some questions from the audience if they have to take. Any questions or any? Hi, uh, good afternoon. My name is Sunaina from uh, Makala Jayakiti. Uh, we are an NGO working in Karnataka with government schools. So, one thing when it comes to scale, uh, one of the challenges we are facing or we are constantly conscious about and thinking about is how do you ensure that, especially as you spread across geographies which all of you have, how do you ensure that the organization's culture and values are, you know, also spread? Because for everything else you have processes, like you are ensure, ensuring your training is done a certain way, the trainers are doing it a certain way, the teachers are teaching a certain way. But the underlying foundation which the founders, uh, you know, started it off with, with the core values and the philosophy and all of that. Uh, so, are there any structured ways you follow of ensuring that is, you know, consistent across uh, all your uh, working places? Answer from Agastya's point of view and then leave that as to talk. Uh, definitely, at the time of, uh, not only do you look for values when they, when you recruit, but the initial training is never purely content training. It's always values and so on. The other thing that we do specifically is the vision, mission, values training is not imparted by uh, the immediate trainer. Always one of us from the absolute leadership position handles that particular session. So you bring all the passion that the founding fathers of that company brought it in or the organization. They talk about their experiences and make it into an inspiring kind of thing. So that, that remains etched forever in their minds. Refreshers very clearly. We embed it in our quality assurance process. I'm sure Sai will talk about it in his workshop when he, uh, in the next session. But we embed it in the quality assurance process of not only should you be very good in content, but you take all the things that I guess they represent so the so it, it's absolutely essential your point is very valid that in a corner of Sikkim how do you make sure that your vision vision lives on or it doesn't get completely morphed into something you you can't recognize yourself how do you make sure so constant communication communication by the highest level of people with great emphasis putting it into the performance appraisal system as one of the things that you will be evaluated on and will be incentivized on goal alignment as you said and all of that is absolutely essential 
and constant vision. Nothing else works. Any other experiences in this? I think uh, you covered and Mr. Dagraj said absolutely entire like they, they, there is no shortcut to it. I think there has to be communication. But when the organization grows so large, it can't be left to individuals also. There have to be systems and processes. <laughs> Example of uh, we run vocational skills institutes in uh, 22 states, okay? and uh, 22 states so culturally diverse and impossible to manage. And but what so we found some way of connecting, but still there are so many gaps. One way of doing it is that periodical uh, leadership dialogue with the teams around, okay? and also periodical leadership define every uh, third month, first week there would be leadership team talks to the through VC or whatever is that. Second would be uh, take the people to the some of the best where you think the, some of the best institutions which represent your values, send the other people to go there, just not the training in the headquarters. I think they need to go there and spend time and work with the community. When they look at their own colleagues of how these value systems are being transferred, adaptability will be much higher. That also can be. So within first six months of recruiting of a person, he or shall go to the best of your locations to be there for a week. All right, experience. Define that. If this is not done and next phase of appraisal, this is not part of this. I think you need to bring in some systems and process to that. Yeah, sir. Good afternoon. I want to, I have one question. Okay. Yeah. So, first of all, uh, so very thankful to the Desmond Foundation. So, this is Sakunayak, Deputy Secretary. PSW Diaries from Tanana, Hyderabad. So actually, sir, uh, we are very much interested to many of things that uh, are in the Life Fellows. And uh, actually, vocational course we started uh, whatever in the, uh, all of the state there, uh, so far after 18 years. But we need to introduce this vocational course in the OER section. So can you suggest to us uh, number one? Number two is actually we want to introduce in the fourth level, that is uh, ninth and tenth and second level. So when they are going to complete the four levels of the vocational various course, so it is equal to the degree, that is the uh, 12 plus 3. So that uh, actually we need to start the program, but uh, we have a problem with, we have no curriculum and uh, trainers. So that uh, can you please suggest us or uh, so you can help uh, with us to provide uh, these curriculum and I think specific guidance on your work can be taken offline because it's not a general question, but I would still like to, you know, yeah, since it's not directly related to. Yeah, when he uh, spoke with our secret service, he very much interested. If you have a lot of ideas, you can please say it to the sure. Or you can, uh, so day after tomorrow, I will call back to you, please. Uh, sure, thank you. There's a question there, yeah. Uh, you mentioned about the uh, treating of uh, ticket branded people. How do we treat and uh, handle uh, ticket, uh, ticket branded people? How do we handle them? How do we handle such situations? Such situations. Those who take it. They should be told they should not be taken. <laughs> and you find a way of doing it. So, I think the. See. These are all, these are all, organizations are like families, systems, all right? There's nothing in isolation. And uh, there are signals that people understand. Somebody is performing, not performing. Uh, they won't wait till the entire annual appraisal is over or two years later. And there are several ways of doing it. But the way that I prefer, the way we do in our organization, and uh, somebody is, uh, is seen as taking for granted, taking things for granted, <coughs> we sit down with him and give an opportunity. So you need to provide an opportunity, you need to actually talk to him directly and tell that individual, look, these are the expectations from you, this is where you are falling short of those expectations, you have the six months, one year to work on them, let me know any support you need, okay? Then provide that opportunity. Even after providing that opportunity, the individual does not perform, obviously it needs to be told that he is not a fit for the organization. But providing opportunity before you decide is very important. Many organizations, many leaders commit a mistake, then the moment first instance comes, somebody tells somebody, somebody comes, because you know, all levels by the time it reaches, it's our head, our managing director, 
would have been filtered, added, biased, unbiased, as other things work. I think the first important thing is that sit down with the individual, treat that individual with respect and give benefit of doubt and opportunity. If you do that, in many cases, I have seen personally, people shape up and start performing. I am Dr. Sidra Meshwari Raymond from Bipil Stopa Road Development. So we are working 16 states. So we work uh, with the small and marginal farmers. Uh, we have formed uh, several uh, federations and uh, agribusiness centers. Uh, they are running on their in Bipil, uh, in uh, Deshpanda Foundation uh, cooperation. We have established 3,000 acre mango orchard. So the initially started with 100% contribution. And uh, during the scaling up, the cost has uh, come down to 3,000 from 13,000. Now we have made them itself uh, CEO and other thing. Thing is that uh, uh, still they uh, hand holding, hand holding uh, for that. 100% uh, um, ownership uh, and uh, they, they they are not equipped. equipped. Uh, to make a hundred percent of their and still scale scale up the activities, is there any uh, uh, clues, uh, some inputs we need? This is like a franchise or a society or a group of yeah. cooperative kind yeah, of thing. Yeah, yeah. Not necessarily a, a structured organization and it's it's uh, structured organization itself. Our aim is to completely take over like us, sister organization. Still, they need some of our assistance uh, things. How to bring them to uh, this uh, one more organization like by? What kind of inputs we have to give the board of directors? Yeah, he told them. No? So, taken into granted. Specific question, maybe offline we can discuss if we can add some value, which I doubt whether we can oh. add any value to you or not. We can. Uh, but one uh, broader uh, suggestion during lunch time, also you are discussing with me. Yeah. I think many of these agriculture, non farm entrepreneurship programs that uh, many of you, many of us, including me in my village, we also do, and many of us are doing. Uh, the question is how to scale, all right? How to scale is the question. And one example that we could study, one success story is the Amun, what yeah, Dr. Yeah. Kurein has done. Yeah, yeah. Several, several uh, best practices are there for all of us to learn and adopt. Yeah. Probably you should look at that. How do you create, produce organizations, how do you create win-win situation, and the whole management structure. I think we need not look far. There's an example there, we can work around that. Thank you. Hi, my name is Vikas and I'm one of the founders and directors of Enable Leadership. We are one of the probably one of the only remote NGOs in the country. We have a very buffer like system where we have about 250 staff members, but we all work on our computers and in the field and so on and so forth. So I resonate with the challenge that you are talking about because I mean from being two people to being 250, it's been really hard for me personally to see how the culture is kind of shaping up. Um, and how it's changing and sometimes not even able to recognize your own organization. But my question specifically is, as time's gone by, I get this constant naggy feeling of something's always wrong. Um, and it comes from, you know, a couple of conversations I might be having in a one-on-one -on -one or in a couple of appraisal conversations or in a general meeting that I'm with, with the team. And that pulse never changes, right? It always is like, okay, is something off, is something off. Uh, my question is, how do we get a good sense, a real sense of the pulse of the organization as it scales out? Um, how do you guys really measure it? I know there are tools in the market like a gather the and stuff that we can probably use, but I'm wondering if you all have any specific tools in your organization that's customized and understandable to the people within the organization that lets you understand is things or are things going fine or not? That's question one. And a very quick diversion to that is how do you adapt um, your recruitment processes to the rural setting as opposed to the urban setting? Because I have personally felt it's really easy to find 
the, the kind of area managers and the higher level managers if you require in an urban area, but find them in a rural area, it's very difficult in non-profit space because all of them seem to have this innate passion to want to go to the field, which is not what I'm looking for. I want someone to be able to man manage, right? So how do you kind of adapt to the rural settings? These are the two questions I have. I think the pulse part of it is simply by being in touch at all levels, uh, senior management traveling and talking to the last person, the organization, those who are actually in touch with your final stakeholder, which is the teacher or the student in our case, uh, keep talking to them. Uh, we do have town halls, we do have very regular meetings, we do have as much transparency as people can talk, people can talk to anybody, people can walk across into rooms. We can. So when that is there, I think in general you can get a sense of what's going on. It's not as if we get 100% sense, but very definitely you know trends. You know that you know something is not great, something is fine, this is going well, this is not so well and so on. That's with respect to. Uh, we do share your agony about not being able to find <laughs> managerial people in rural settings. Uh, we, uh, I think it's improving tier two, three or three towns. You are able to get. Um, in many cases, such things are actually solved by upscaling your existing people. For those areas where you are unable to get, uh, you know, by group or by group, you are not able to get good people in a rural setting. Your homegrown people from that area with those skills may be the best bet that you have. Try them out. I'm sure you know a whole lot of them will succeed. It may take a little longer, but I think that's the way we have gone about doing that. Any other experiences in that? I think we can. I think we are running short of time. Okay, so shall we? Just I think you need to. It can be measured. Okay. So if vocational skills as a context being, if the placements are low, if the retention is low, first percentage are low, you know there are indicators, system throws up. I think that's where you, then the immediately corrective action is taken. But for the, the organization changing its original context, these repeated failures wouldn't have occurred. That's a measure, that's a policy. I think it can be measured and acted upon. Thank you everyone.